And so in a sense, it's helpful that I have this because it's a circle. And that means that I can draw with it a circle to represent the motion of my particle. There we are. So we have a particle which is moving on a circle. So on this line a little bit there. And what we want to be able to do with today is just describe the motion around this circle. Next time we'll look at uh, the dynamics of circular motion, specifically centripetal force. For right now though, <coughs> what we want to consider is what kind of motion is this? Is this a two-dimensional motion? Is it a one-dimensional motion? Is it a three-dimensional motion? I kind of said those in a random order. And basically, how would we maybe describe the motion about this circle if you had any object, a particle, um, sort of a classical electron in an orbit, like a classical orbit? Uh, a planet moving around a star in a uniformly, perfectly circular orbit, which is a little off from how the actual orbits tend to go, but in principle you could. And in order to describe this thing's motion, we would have to maybe set up somewhere a coordinate system. So we'll put an origin here in the center of the circle. And you have your object and it's being constrained to move around this circle somehow. So we ask, how do you define the position of the object? This would be your position vector. All right. How would we define the <coughs> position vector for the object? Well, one option is to use rectilinear coordinates. In other words, use Cartesian coordinates and give an x and a y for the position. All right. And so maybe you have an initial position, x initial and y initial, and then the thing moves a bit to a new point on the circle. You get a new position. Oops. This new position would be your x final, your y final. All right, so this could be described as a two-dimensional motion. You have an x-coordinate, you have a y-coordinate. You have perhaps <coughs> a velocity in x, you have a velocity in y. You have an acceleration in x, you have an acceleration in y. All right, and we could model this in two dimensions in this way. So how do you get x and y on a circle? <coughs> What do you do in order to get the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate? What, what information would be useful to know? All right, so where are we defining the origin? That's one piece of information. All right, so I'm going to define my origin to be the center of the circle. All right, so I'll write it down here for you. Origin is at center of circle. What else might we want to know? Yes? Like the radius distance from the center of the circle. Okay, so how big is this circle? So these, since they start <coughs> at the origin, which is at the center, and they end somewhere on the circle itself, these both could represent a radius. At least the length of the line could represent the radius of your circle. 
So we need that, we need radius. The arc length. Okay. So we could maybe determine the arc length here, which is fine. That helps for figuring out how far it's actually traveled, right? And then, so I'll write that in. I'll say arc length equals distance traveled. And then you said the angle. Okay, so angle. And in fact, instead of putting a bullet here, a new bullet for angle, I'm going to actually put it <coughs> here next to radius. Because if you have an origin specified at the center of the circle and you know the radius and the angle, then you've also specified the actual position of the object. In other words, this and this combined with this gives you the position, but in polar coordinates, in circular coordinates, in other words. So the angle, go ahead and erase this R to give myself a little more space to write. The angle is always defined for us as being counterclockwise from the positive x-axis. That's our, um, it's not so much our definition as our sign convention, perhaps. Our, our direction for a positive angle, in other words. So this right here might represent theta initial. This right here might represent theta final. Okay, and so delta theta would represent the change in angular position. So we'll specify angle as theta. Now here's another thing to think about. <coughs> Does the value of r change when I move from here to here? The value of r does not change from here to here. It's a circle, so it shouldn't change. How do we know it? Because a circle could be defined as the collection of all points which are an equal distance from the center within a given plane. Yeah? do not know the angle just based on having an origin and a radius. You have to further measure to get the angle. My claim is not that you know where the angle is. My claim is if you know where the angle is and you know the radius, then you know where the location of the object is on the circle. Okay. So, right, so once you've measured the angle, though, now you know what the angle is. And if you measure this angle and you measure that angle, you can subtract the two from each other. and subtract the initial from the final, and you get a delta theta. So that, combined with radius, can also give you the change in position. All right. So notice, though, that once you've measured the radius, you're done with measuring radii. Radius won't change because you're on a uniform circle. All you have to measure now is just theta each time. All right, so the only thing that's actually changing is theta. That means that what we had here in, in rectilinear coordinates, in, uh, in Cartesian coordinates, as a two-dimensional problem, in a sense, reduces to a one-dimensional problem if we switch to these coordinates. Because we know the value of r, the only thing we really have to keep track of to know where the thing is, is the theta. Alright. So now let's consider a few things. If I just keep track of, well, a value for r, but I keep track of changes in theta, <coughs> does that let me get changes in x and y and so on? And the answer is yes. 
especially provided that I know an initial angle of some sort, knowing the angle and knowing the change in angle collectively lets me get out, if I want it, x and y and arc length, for that matter, and so on. How do I get the arc length out of that, by the way? Does anybody know? There's a formula. Yes, there is. <laughs> Um, let's use for the arc length an S. All right. Now you've seen an S used before to represent a distance traveled, so this shouldn't be a surprise. We're using an S for an arc length. How do we get arc length out of radius and out of angles? Well, one way that we could um, consider it is basically to say, suppose that I decided to go all the way around the circle. All right? So my arc length, therefore, is one whole revolution around the circle's worth of path distance. What would we call that arc length? I heard two different answers. And I'm not going to say either one's wrong, because they both sounded right. One of them was the name, and the other sounded like how you find it. So let's start with the name. What was the name of the arc length going one time around the circle? Okay, so this is a circumference. So this would be defined as you know, maybe C equals s as a function of theta, theta being one whole revolution to pi, and this is, now we need the formula, 2 pi, you say 2 pi r squared? Okay, yeah, I've now heard three versions. I've heard 2 pi r squared, I've heard somebody say cubed, so I'm thinking that's 2 pi r cubed is what they mean. And then I also heard just 2 pi r. Those are the three answers I heard. So the first one was 2 pi r squared, and then two people interjected with their own versions. How can we figure out which of these three it is? Do we agree as a class that it's one of those three? It's either 2 pi r, 2 pi r squared, or 2 pi r cubed? <laughs> Okay, so let's eliminate the cube because that usually goes with a three-dimensional thing. All right, that's good reasoning. There's another way we can figure out which of the two it is, though. We can be more, we can more easily do it simply. This is using something that we did early in the semester, which is use dimensional analysis. So this thing right here, these are arc lengths. This means it's a length. So it needs to have dimension of what? What did I ask? Um, I asked what kind of dimension this has to have. <coughs> this is an arc length. So what kind of dimension does arc length need to have? <coughs> need to have? Excuse me. Does it need to have dimension area? Does it need to have dimension volume? need to have dimension speed, does it need to have dimension length, does it need to have dimension time, length, okay, what do you think, you think that the arc length needs to have dimension area, it's a length. The circumference is the same thing as a perimeter for a circle. How do you find the perimeter of a thing? You add up the lengths of the sides. If it's a geometric figure that's not curvy, and, you know the same kind of applies for a circle. It's just every side is sort of infinitesimally short, and so on. Right, so this has to have dimension length. It <laughs> means the version we want is two pi r. Because that's the thing that has dimension length. 2 pi 
has dimension radian, which is essentially dimensionless. R has dimension length. <coughs> okay. Now let's imagine, instead of going around a whole revolution, we go around only a half a revolution. What would the arc length be if we went around only a half revolution? Okay, so S of pi is equal to what? Just pi r. If we do a quarter of a revolution, And so on. So the pattern seems to be whatever angle I put in here, S of theta, the arc length is just that angle times the radius. Okay, so that's how you get your arc length for your circle. Okay. Now what is it that arc length told us? It's the distance traveled. In other words, it's the combination of your delta x and your delta y taken around a curve. Just delta x and just delta y will get you displacement, and that's the chord length, and that's something else entirely. You can also figure that one out if you'd like. But for the arc length, it's the total distance traveled in taking that path. All right? So if you want to consider distances, we want to, if we want to consider a distance traveled, probably we actually need to use not theta, but delta theta, right? So, really, we should have a delta here for the theta, and a delta here for the theta. And so, what this is telling us is, we use theta to find position, we use delta theta to find <coughs> Uh, distance traveled, we could also, for that matter, use delta theta to figure out displacement. So that would be basically the chord that runs from this point to this point. How do you find the chord? Well, let's redraw this triangle over here, but blown up a bit. So my chord runs from one to the other. This angle right here is my delta theta. I want to find this side length right here. Now one way that I could do that is draw a dashed line. I didn't draw it perfectly. It should actually bisect the chord. There we go. And this perpendicular line which bisects the chord will be perpendicular to the chord. In other words, I just turn my one triangle into two right triangles. So this would be like one half of, and this would be one half of your total displacement. Let's say delta delta D or whatever. Or delta P for position. <coughs> so how do I find this half of my displacement? What do I got to do? I have a right angle here. I have here that this is half of delta theta. And I have that this side length out here is actually radius r. Because remember that we define this by picking from two points on the circle. So a little bit of trigonometry says that the sine of one half delta theta is going to get me one half of delta d, one half of my displacement magnitude divided by r. Okay, so I take an arc sine 
and now I've got half the chord length, and now I double that, and I've got the whole chord length, which is my actual displacement. Just a little bit of geometry. All right. So what we're finding, therefore, is given that we know the size of the circle, as long as we specify the angle, we can extract position, displacement, distance traveled, etc. Implication, it would be useful for us to describe the motion of this thing in terms just of the angle given a known radius. Right, so instead of describing this motion using kinematics in XYZ, where we'd say something like X final equals one half A T squared plus V initial T plus X initial, and Y final is one half A, these are subscripted by the way, A sub Y T squared, V I Y T, and Y initial. Instead of doing something like this, it'd be useful for us to have some equation which lets us describe the motion in terms of only theta. Not to mention, by the way, this equation breaks down a little bit when you're on a circle because, as we'll see, um, well, next time, really the acceleration isn't actually constant. The magnitude is, but the direction is continually changing. Okay, so that's a preview of next time. So these equations, they're not really gonna work very well for us because if the direction changes, then the components of A are gonna be changing. And if the components of A are changing, if A is changing, then you cannot use that to describe <coughs> have to do something else. However, if instead of using that pair of equations, if we try to describe theta using what we know of kinematics, we'll find that the constant acceleration equations in angular terms do work out, assuming, of course, that this thing moves with a uniform speed. Um, in fact, uh, not a uniform speed, a uniform angular acceleration. Uniform speed will also work, but a uniform angular acceleration is the condition we need here. So it could be speeding up or slowing down. It just needs to be doing so at a constant rate. So what would that look like? What would we need in order to get an equation in terms of theta that is just using uh, speeds and angles and whatnot. What would we need to define? Well, we'd need to define a speed, but in terms of angle. We need to define an acceleration, but in terms of angle. One way that we could do that is we could say, let's define omega to be the angular speed, all right? So how would we define an angular speed? What would that look like as a definition? Okay, tricky question maybe. How would we define just plain old speed or plain old velocity for that matter? How do we define that one? Okay, so speed was distance travel over time, and velocity was? Say again? Displacement over time. Okay. So by analogy, this thing right here is supposed to be basically like an angular velocity. This one right here is our angular position. So this right here should probably have a similar form. So we'll define it as delta theta over delta t. Okay. 
We've just now defined angular velocity for ourselves. And now we ask, does this work? Can we define a term that describes the rate at which the thing is traveling around um, a circle? The answer is, yeah, of course we can. And in fact, you're all, in some sense, familiar with an angular velocity because it's telling you, essentially, how quickly is the circle completed? How quickly is one whole revolution completed? Now, the trick here is, theta was in radians, so that means that this right here is actually going to be in radians per second by dimensional analysis. And so really, it's not telling you how many uh, total revolutions per second do you get, but rather, how many radians do you pass through per second. So this thing right here is therefore equivalent to 2 pi times the number of revolutions or cycles per second. So we have a word for number of revolutions or cycles per second. Is called the frequency. So we use a, a lowercase f for that. You see that in the lab. I think you did um, you did a pendulum lab early on in the semester, where you had to measure the period of the pendulum. So the period of the pendulum that told you how much time does it take. You take a pendulum, you pull it back, you release it, and it swings back and forth like this. How much time does it take to make one whole swing like this? That's your period. Your frequency is how many complete swings does it make per second? All right, so by analogously, what we find here is that there's a thing called a period, and that's how much time does it take to make one whole revolution. There's a frequency, which is how many revolutions per second, and they are related as inverses of each other. So omega here, what it really is telling you is 2 pi divided by the period. So if you know omega, and if omega is constant, then you know how much time it's going to take to make a whole revolution. All right. And again, I define this as an average of omega. Just as with velocity, we can figure out an instantaneous value for the angular speed. Basically just consider very, very short amounts of time. All right. And we need another term to take the place of acceleration. So our average acceleration is our delta omega over delta t. All right, so we're going to use omega and we're going to use alpha instead of v and a. But they're going to have similar meaning. They're going to have analogous meanings as when we had v and a. So it follows that, and I won't show this because we've already shown it for the case of simple linear motion, but the math is the same. <coughs> it follows that if alpha, the angular acceleration, is constant, then we can write, uh, whoops, we can write that the position, the angular position, is one half of alpha times t, the time squared, plus your initial speed, your initial angular speed here, times time, plus your initial position. All right. So notice that the form of this equation is the same as the form of the other two equations that we wrote before. It's just that now instead of having to write two equations to describe position, one for x and one for y, you can write out one equation, theta, and then if, for some reason, you need to extract x and y from it, you can do so. You can do so geometrically.
because once you know where theta is, and here I'll go ahead and erase and redraw, once you know where the thing is, you can figure out where the x and the y are by using simple trigonometry. Same right angle trig that we've been using in uh, you know, this semester. So if this right here gives you your theta, here's your x-axis, then you can find x by projecting downward onto the x-axis. So this right here would be your x. You can project onto the y-axis. This right here would be your y. So how do we get x and y? Well, we take the radius, the known radius of the circle, and we multiply it by cosine theta to get x, and we multiply it by sine theta to get y. So x is r cosine theta, y is r sine theta. Therefore, we can also find the change in x and the change in y, although that one is going to kind of require not only a delta theta, but also an initial theta. Because not all delta thetas are going to give you the same delta x and the same delta y for the same delta theta. If I start from here and I move to here, I'm not getting a very big delta y, but I am getting a big delta x. That same thing applied down here gives me a not very big delta x, but a very big delta y. So we have to know both the initial and the change in order to figure out the actual delta x and delta y. All right. So let's see. Let's do some examples with this stuff. We'll start with some simple examples, get ourselves warmed up on this cold morning. Maybe you've got a, I've erased my circle, so maybe you've got an object that's moving about a circle. Maybe you start at some position, we'll say that this is theta initial of zero. In other words, you're right on the x-axis. You end on theta final is, I don't know, let's say pi over three. And it takes us delta t 0 0.1 seconds to do this. What would the resulting speed, average speed, be for this motion? And specifically, I mean the average angular speed, not the average linear speed. All right, so we need delta theta over delta t to get our omega. So what we have here is, whoops. Is uh, pi over 3 minus 0 divided by 0 0.1. And so you end up with basically 10 pi over 3. And the unit for that is radians per second, which we usually just write as inverse seconds. Okay? So as I said, simple warm up question. Now, let's add to it a little. What if this thing were going to, uh, sorry, if, if we wanted to measure out how far this little dot has traveled in, in going from 0 to pi over 3, what would that distance be given that this circle has a radius of 
about 10 centimeters. All right. How far has it traveled? So how do we get the arc length? Does anybody remember without looking? No? So what? R theta. R theta. Okay, so S equals R, it's actually R delta theta. But since theta initial is zero, I guess this is the same as R times theta final. All right, so we have 0 0.1 meters. That's 10 centimeters, times our delta theta, our pi over 3. And so what we end up with is something like pi over 30. If we were ignoring significant figures, we could just write pi over 30 and call it a day. Inverse seconds. And if you want, you can also plug into your calculator and get some decimal and apply significant figure rules to it if you'd like. Not seconds. This is in meters. Apparently I need to warm up too. All right. Next question. This is, let's see if we can apply our knowledge. Imagine that this thing is not just a circle, but instead, whoop, not a very good one, but a wheel. This one, oh, it has a taper to it. That's why it's not going to roll for me. You have to, like, maybe line it up here, and it's going to fall on the floor and break. Imagine it's a wheel like this. So it rolls like this. Right. How far will it have rolled, given these information, in assuming, by the way, that we have a constant rate of revolution, so no acceleration. How far is it going to roll in a second? Now we're going to, uh, uh, we have to evoke one thing, which is a condition called rolling without slipping. So what's rolling without slipping mean? It means that if it rolls like this, it travels without doing one of these things. This is rolling with slipping. It's rolling, but it's not moving as far as it should based on how much it's rolling. Rolling without slipping you could think of it as if this right here, instead of having a, a wheel, if I took a piece of paper and I rolled it into a circular shape, rolling without slipping is almost analogous to as it rolls, it unrolls. So when it's rolled this far, it's gone through one revolution. So if it rolls without slipping, how far will this wheel have rolled in one second? How far will it have moved in one second? How do we get that? Okay, so you're saying figure out what delta theta is in one second, and then apply it. Okay, apply, apply it how? Find the arc length, you say? Yeah, use the arc length that we already found. Okay. Okay, so you want to say this is uh, this is your arc length in 
0.1 second. So multiply it by 10 because you have 10 of these yeah. 0.1 second increments, and that's your total arc length. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. That is a valid way of doing it. And what does that arc length tell you, that total arc length? Okay, so that's how far it's rolled in one second. So one way of doing it would be S equals, we'll call this like S of 0 0.1 or something. So S would be 10 times S of 0 0.1. All right, so that gets us, you know, our pi over 3. Okay, so it's rolled that many meters. This is about one meter, right? A little, little more than one meter, because pi is just a little more than three. All right, so that is one valid way of approaching this problem. Good problem solving. Let's generalize it, though. What if what we wanted to do was figure out, for an arbitrary time t, how far the thing is going to roll? How might we do that? What would the process look like if we wanted for arbitrary time t, how far the thing's going to roll? We've got, we got to sort of reverse engineer this thing that you've just done, given that it's one second and therefore ten times. Something? No? Okay. I'll let you think on it. Does anybody have any ideas? All right, well, let's walk ourselves backwards through what we've done here a little bit, right? So, we decided that for 10 seconds what you do is you take your arc length for 0.1 second and you multiply it by 10 because this was 0.1 second and we now want for 10 times that length, one second. All right, so one way of looking at it is what length of time do we want and how is that related to the length of time specified here? So we could always try to do a ratio of actual time versus time to go this far, and then multiply that ratio by this distance. If we do it that way, I think what we'll find is, you know, how did we get this right here? We multiplied r times delta theta, right? So whatever our solution has in it, it's going to need to have a delta theta times an r. All right? Now we're told that there's also a length of time that we spent moving, actually moving. So this would be like the time actually moving, divided by, because we're trying to get a ratio, divided by the amount of time that we spent to go just this distance. Does everybody agree with that statement? So time to go just this distance, we'll call it delta t to distinguish it from the time actually spent moving. All right. So now let's combine these like this. So this right here would be your arc length and therefore your distance traveled for a general time. And actually, since I took out the numbers, it really should work for a general wheel as well because r is now arbitrary here. All right, and I noticed that I have a t over delta t here that I can move the delta t wherever I feel like moving it in the equation is the same, you know, same quantity, right? So I have t, I have r, and I have, what's that other thing? That's an omega, right? So I have S is equal to T times R times omega. Okay. Now, what is R times omega giving me? 
what kind of dimension does that have? Well, that has a distance times a fake unit, which is radians. So it's really a distance times fake unit over time. It's a distance over time. <coughs> What's a distance over time? It's a speed. So this right here is somehow <coughs> equivalent to speed v. Now, is the equivalent just by accident? Is it an accidental equivalence? Well, r was constant, right? It's raised to the wheel. If r is constant, and I have r times a delta something, I can always move the r inside the delta because the r isn't changing. So this right here could also be looked at as t times delta of r theta over delta t. Or if you'd like, you could move it to the other side of this, like this, have the delta theta times r. What's delta theta times r? What is it that that thing gave us? That was our original arc length formula. So this right here is arc length delta s. And what is delta s over delta t? Arc length, remember, is the distance we traveled. So we can replace the delta s with a d for distance, if we'd like. What does distance over time give us? Speed. OK, so it's not just a superficial, accidental, the units lined up there. <coughs> it actually is true to say that r times omega is equal to somehow the speed that this thing's going to go. There's actually a little more to it than that. R times omega gives you the instantaneous speed that you're moving, your translational speed. It also, as it turns out, happens to give you the instantaneous tangential speed of the dot as it, or of the point on the wheel as it moves around the wheel if the wheel is just spinning in place. If the wheel is not spinning in place, then you have to